when you go to sit down with someone and they're going to sell a property, most people have where they are right now and where they want to be. And the bigger that gap is, the more that they're willing to knock off the price in order to solve that problem. A lot of people think in negotiation is this like back and forth haggling. Really what negotiation is, is like, how can I solve your problem and how can I make that deal work for me? Today, I'm sitting out with Michael McKay to talk about negotiating smarter deals and knowing when to pivot. He went from Airbnb to flipping properties and his negotiation tactics for deals is next level. So if you want to learn how to negotiate your real estate deals, whether it's a short-term rental or a long-term rental, this episode's for you. So let's get into it. Welcome back to STR Like the Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. The purpose of STR Like the Best is to help you better invest your time and money in short-term rentals and real estate investing. And I'm really excited to invite my friend, Michael McKay, onto the show. Mike, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you joining. Mike is probably one of the longest friends I've had in real estate broadly ever since I started short-term rentals, Airbnb investing back in 2016. Uh, Our short history is Mike used to live in New York and he had these meetups and my wife, uh, Liz, went to one of his meetups back in the summer of 2016, I think. And we were having, we were encountering growing pains and trying to figure out how to scale our business. And Mike has been, you know, really a mentor to us in that regards and has been really generous with his time and his expertise. So I'm excited and, 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 you know, like kind of honored actually to have you on because I mean, we've been trying to do this for a long time, but you have been, you know, not just to me, even to other people that I've talked to, like, oh yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I know I'm okay. And (laughs) Yeah, so that's it, you know, it's uh it's good to it's good to have you on. Yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> a man a man of few words. Um so Mike <laughs> <It's your show. laughs> perfect for on the podcast. <laughs> no, uh, but Mike, why, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and maybe just give us a little bit start with what you're doing now in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. A little bit of the history too of in short term rentals. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually not in the short term rental business anymore. I'm still in real estate investing um, in Jacksonville, Florida now. We buy and flip a lot of properties down here. Specifically, actually, one of our big niches is uh, we flip a lot of mobile homes on land. But prior to this, um, I was in the short term rental business for a long time. I'm actually trying to remember the year that I started, but I guess it was before 2016. <laughs> um so I, you know, got in the short-term rental business in in New York City. Um, started out kind of accidentally renting out my room. Not accidentally, but I was going. I guess it was 2014, and I was going to Spain for two weeks. And I heard about this Airbnb thing, which sounds crazy now because everyone knows what it is. But back then, people wasn't like everyone knew what it was. I told my roommate, I said, "Hey, do you mind if I do this thing?" Um, I'll give you 20% of the profits if anyone even books on here and, uh, you know, you can just let them in or whatever and clean the place. It was a very low quality listing with some very low quality cell phone photos, but it booked right away. <laughs> and, uh, my share of the rent for that apartment at the time, I think was $1,200 a month. And I made like 1100 bucks in my 11 day trip. With totally unoptimized, you know, listing, right? So that was clearly not the potential, especially since it booked two hours after I put it up. So now I realize I left <laughs> money on the table. <laughs> but at the time, I was happy. Um, so from there, I, you know, kind of started to see, okay, well, I've always been an entrepreneur. There's this potential of, of this as a business. So when I moved to a new apartment, I decided to get an extra room, do it full time. And then I started picking up some places in Jersey City. I partnered with some guys and we ended up picking up quite a lot of places in Jersey City and then quite a few in Arizona. That was a little bit of a disaster that we can get into it in this this conversation if you want to. <laughs> yeah, um, no, we should. And and um, I was ultimately kind of ramping down the short-term rental business as COVID came. I had a couple of units left in Jersey City. And, uh, you know, I realized at the end of the day that frankly, I just didn't like hospitality, that I was really more of an investor. Only took me, you know, six years to figure that out, right? Um, but, uh, I think it's a great business, but I I don't have the hospitality mindset. So I decided I wanted to focus on, you know, what I do well, which is, and what I enjoy, which is being an investor. So that's why I took the turn. So 
nothing wrong with the short term rental business. Just was it was realized it wasn't for me anymore. Oh, that's great. And, and I think know thyself. I forget who that quote is from, but I think as you get older and with more life experience and the bumps and bruises that come along with that, you know, I think that adage, at least for me, I think about that every day more and more. Like, what are you good yeah. at? And what do you like? What do you want to spend time on? I think that ultimately, you know, this is the part about, you know, investing your time, not just your capital, but also your time uh, or financial capital, but also your time. It's, you know, if you're doing something that you are good at, like you'll probably enjoy it more. And if you enjoy it more, you'll probably spend more time doing it and be better at it. And then that compounding effect of doing something for a long period of time that you like, that you enjoy success, it usually leads to, you know, good things. Um, but we'll circle back on the short-term rental side and that history. I think that's actually pretty, it's a really interesting note for folks too that are listening to this that have flipped before or wholesaled and done a lot of the, the other things in real estate investing and kind of hearing your story and now how you built your real estate business. I'll let you describe it, your real estate business in Jacksonville. So, you know, along that vein, like when did you move down to, you know, you're living in New York. When did you move down to, to Florida? Um, so it was, I think it was about October or November of 2020. 2020 so I moved right. out of New York, you know, obviously beginning of COVID, I wasn't trying to stay in uh, New York city at the time. So I had gone back to Connecticut for a bit, but I uh, never really was much of a fan of Connecticut. So I, uh, you know, left a few months later, no offense, anyone in Connecticut. Um, and I came down here. So why Jacksonville? Why not, you know, Orlando, or, you know, Miami, Miami was obviously like the big hot spot during COVID and now. Yeah. So people, um, people always ask me why I picked Jacksonville as a real estate market. And the answer is I didn't pick Jacksonville as a real estate market. I picked Jacksonville because, um, I had been coming down here for a long time when my grandparents used to live here. And during COVID, we still had my gra- grandparents' house at the time. And, uh, I had a place to go that wasn't Connecticut. Okay. And so I didn't necessarily plan on staying here or starting a business here. I just came down here and I said, well, I'll go for a month and I see if I like it. And I mean, I can do what I like business wise. I don't want to say anywhere, but in a lot of different places. So I came here and I really liked Jacksonville. Miami is a little too chaotic for me. So it was really more of a personal choice than it was a business choice. I didn't like look at the top hottest real estate markets in the United States. So I just looked for a place to live. <laughs> If you see a, a list of the hottest real estate markets, you're probably too late to be candid. <laughs> but it's, you yeah, know, I think, it, it was just a good point about there's always opportunity. There's opportunity everywhere, really. Mm-hmm. And going to a place that you're familiar with, that you have connectivity, that you have history with, I think it gives you more confidence in making you know investment decisions because you just have a larger data set of experiences and maybe network to pull from. And that really kind of helps you at least stand up a business initially. And then, you know, then it's kind of up to the, the quality of the entrepreneur. And I probably, you know, and I would, and we can hit on this too, but like, I, I would think your experience in short-term rentals probably helped you in, in multiple ways as you scale your, your flipping business. But maybe, mm-hmm. um, and I don't want to pigeonhole into flipping if you're doing other stuff, but maybe just talk about what your business is now. Um, and maybe yeah. some numbers if you want to share how many, you know, volume in terms of how many houses, property value, whatever you'd like to share. Sure. Um, so it is mostly a flipping business for now, um, just because of where we are with interest rates. We just aren't able to keep the number of rentals, long-term rentals that we would like to keep. The core of our business is, and that's where I say everything starts from, is direct to seller acquisitions. So a lot of people think of that as wholesaling, but we actually buy a lot of the stuff ourselves. It's the same methodology, right? Is you're marketing to distressed sellers and you're trying to buy a property for a discount. So that's where our business starts. We're good at, we're good at marketing. We're good at sales. You know, my vision is to build this, to, um, have another, you know, three or four sales reps hired. And if I could build a sales team of people who are making amazing money for Jacksonville, which my target for my sales reps to make is 250 grand a year, then we're going to do really well as a business. So that's where it all starts. Uh, we, we go and we get the deals, we get them under contract, and then we decide what to do with them after. We know we have a deal. I like being on the direct to seller side because I heard this from a friend a long time ago who's, who's done thousands of deals. And he said, you know, in real estate, you make money buying one-to-one and, you, and selling one-to-many. 
if I'm sitting across the table from you, I can offer you something that might be very easy for me to offer you. Like maybe I can close quickly. Maybe I can let you stay after closing, whatever that might be. I can solve your problem. I can get it done before the foreclosure auction in six or seven days. And to me, that might be something that's easy to do, but to you, that's worth a very large dollar amount. Or maybe I'll evict your tenants. Maybe I'll buy it with your tenants in there and I'll take care of them after closing. Most people are scared to do that. But to me, that's just a process. You know, we, we've, we've done it once and we'll do it again. I can solve these problems for people being one-to-one that are worth an exponential amount dollar-wise to what it really costs me to solve that problem because I have processes in place to deal with it. So in terms of like volume, what we're doing now, um, we, we are probably doing five or six deals a month at this point. And we try to focus on deals that a lot of people who are just in the wholesaling business, they don't do other exit strategies. You know, they're trying to make 10 grand a deal or 15 grand a deal. You know, my, th- my theory is I'd rather do less deals and make bigger margin. There's a lot more safety Always. in that. Gives you a lot more flexibility on the deal. So um, we're targeting, depending on the property type, either a 30 or 40 grand uh, gross profit on each deal. Okay. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you can think about how you found this podcast, maybe it was on TikTok or Instagram, or maybe someone shared it with you. I don't run ads for the show or have any sponsorships. So the only way this grows is through word of mouth. If my podcast is valuable for you in any way, please hit the subscribe button and share this with someone who you think would help their investing journey or business. Thanks a lot. And let's continue on with the episode. So let's kind of dive in. Let's just dig into that. I think two parts. I want to, I want to dig into the selling part, which I know you're very good at. And then also the, how you are able to do in the negotiation part, right? Because to your point on the one-to-one and, you know, funny enough, that's how we scaled our acquisition we bought one property so you know we have i think at the time probably 20 short-term rental units that we didn't own that we you know utilized the rental arbitrage strategy where you know we would go mm-hmm. to these large buildings in philadelphia and rent apartments and then we rent them on airbnb we actually hadn't owned anything yet or any short-term rentals yet and we bought one property through a broker in the smoky mountains in tennessee and the market was, and this was, we closed September of 2020 and the market was, you know, white hot and no, you know, it was just so hard to get any deal to do. And I don't know if it was from, it was from you actually, cause I asked you and you were doing direct to seller and I asked you like, oh, I, you know, what about we send postcards? I get like, yeah, you can do that. There's other strategies. I remember, um, I think you're the one that, uh, recommended click to mail. <laughs> Dude, I've made so much, you know, that one piece of advice made us a lot of money because I basically used, I basically took that. I went through the property tax records of the place, the, the communities that I liked. And I had a VA go through all that, put in a spreadsheet. I wrote down some pretty basic copy and we sent it out. And I think we sent 150. I remember it was like 100, maybe we sent like 150 or 200 in the first batch. It cost us maybe a buck quarter, maybe each. It was like 300 bucks. It's like, let's try it. If it doesn't work, 300 bucks, doesn't matter. We got a couple of responses that didn't pan out to be anything. But then there was a property that we were, the broker had showed us. We didn't like, we we're like, it's, you know, he was like, it's a competitive process, blah, blah, blah. And then the seller ended up not liking the deals and walked away from that broker. And then after, their brokerage agreement had expired. He called me. He's like, yeah, hey, actually I got your post. I've been holding on to your postage card until the listing agreement had been done. And the listing agreement expires on Friday. And I don't know if you're so interested, but I know you own something here too. So maybe we just do a deal together. And that's what we did. And it was a six bedroom. We Mm -hmm. bought it for 729. We got like a 5K seller credit. Probably the best deal I've ever had. (laughs) Uh, that thing has done over 200,000 of gross revenue every single year since we bought it with a very minimal 10 K redecorating. So it it basically cash flow is like a hundred grand a year plus it's ridiculous. People don't, people like, I tell people the numbers and it it almost sounds unreal. I don't even like share the numbers anymore. So what do you, I'll (laughs) just tell you. 
And then like this year it's on track, even like in, you know, as the market slow down, it's still year to day, it's like 187. On the high, it was like 220 something. Anyways, you know, like great numbers. And the properties, I could sell it in a week for like one, two. And if I put it on a market, I'd get like one, four for it. So, and then we did, that was, the, I was curious. So we did four of the deals exactly like that afterwards until the rates. Yeah. And we should, I mean, Ken, we should went a lot faster. I was, I was too new at it, but yeah, that one, two, I appreciate your patience. Like that one to one, I was able to solve a problem for him because he just didn't like, he didn't like the sale process with, um, he didn't like an auction process. He was like an older gentleman and he just wanted to deal with someone that he could pick up the phone and talk to. And, you know, he had friends coming in. So can we delay the closing date by you know, a few weeks? There's no friends coming. Sure. No problem. The, you know, whatever. Right. Um, yeah. It was amazing. And, you know, the one to many for me is the Airbnb side for you. It's obviously, you know, your seller universe, but yeah, I think that's a great, your friend is very wise because I think that's a great way to create value for yourself is delivering something that maybe costs you very little, but it's worth a lot to the other side. And you can only ascertain that when you have a direct conversation with someone, you're sitting on the phone with them or a video call across the table on text, whatever it is, whatever the methodology is, um, you can actually, you know, get a great deal. And yeah, I don't, I don't know if I share that with you, but, um, it worked out really, it worked out really, really, it worked out really, really well for us. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, I knew you got one. I didn't know all the details. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, had, we, we got, we got four, we got four that way. We got, yeah, we had wow. four that way. And you know, it, it, it also helps you when you create that connection. Like we got, we would get off, we got off market to things that weren't listed yet. They were like thinking about selling, okay. didn't want to pay the 6% to the brokers. So that was like, all right, well, this is the comp and let's take 3% off the deal. And I get time to do my due diligence as well <laughs> versus just having to, you know, sign a contract with no contingencies. So it, it, it worked out really well. And, you know, I guess the question I want to ask you is, how much has that helped your, you know, as you're thinking about, you know, people are thinking about flipping, I presume that's like a really good way to get something to, to give you that 30, 40 K of spread that you can work with versus the typical 10 K spread. And then maybe talk about like how that helps you, you know, get that big of a discount or how that makes your deal process kind of work a lot better. Your yeah. selling, your, your ability to sell direct. Yeah, I think it's huge. Um, and, you know, I'm in a market like Jacksonville where, you know, these homes that we're flipping, we're selling usually for sub 300 K, usually 250, 300, maybe we do some three fifties. So obviously you're going to want a bigger margin if you're in a 600 K $700 million price range. But I think it's like, it's pretty simple when you go to sit down with someone, right. And they're going to sell a property. Most people have where they are right now and where they want to be. And I call that gap pain, right? And the bigger that gap is, the more that they're willing to knock off the price in order to solve that problem. So in order to negotiate with someone, a lot of people think in negotiation is this like back and forth haggling. Really what negotiation is, is like, how can I solve your problem? And how can I make that deal work for me? So the bigger of a problem they have, it's just a conversation with them. The bigger that gap is, my job is to then go and build a bridge from where they are to where they want to be. And if that gap is really big and I build a bridge that gets them there perfectly for what they're looking for, then, then they're ecstatic to sell me the property. And it sounds crazy, right? Like I used to be a real estate agent and at every almost, I don't want to say every closing, but every couple closings, people are sour about something, right? Either like, oh, well, that took, yeah, you got me my price, but it took four months or, oh, you got me my price, but the buyers were such a pain, right? But like when I go to a closing for a property that I'm buying and I'm really solving their problem, even though I'm buying the property at a discount, I mean, people like are like, thank you so much. You helped me out of this yeah. situation. Do you give an example maybe of like a deal that you're especially, it doesn't even be the most profitable, just a deal that you're, you're most, especially, you're especially proud of. Yeah. Um, I have one. This is, and I, the reason I'll tell this story is because it's a very unique situation that requires like, no one would think that this would be something that would cause someone to have that gap. All right. So I'm particularly proud of this because I sat with this person and I really understood what was going on in their world. 
And then I was able to solve it and we were able to get the deal. By the way, it's the, probably one of the nicest rental properties I ever bought. I actually, her and I met at a coffee shop because she didn't want to tell the tenant that she was selling it first. I saw it after. And I, when sellers tell me the property is nice, I, I kind of think it's nice, but you know, I'm sure they're sugarcoating in a bit. This was nicer than she told me. <laughs> the cleanest <laughs> rental property I've ever seen. Um, but I was, I was sitting down with her in a coffee shop and you know, she had this newer home. I think it was a, it was an early, it was a 2004 built home. And she was telling me, she's like, I've got a tenant there. She told me what they were paying rent. It was a little under market, but I was like, I mean, she was like, it covers the mortgage, all that. And I'm like, I just didn't understand why she was selling it. And I just told her that at one point, I'm like, Hey, it seems like you got a good thing going here. I mean, your rent's a little under market. You could probably get a little bit more, but I mean, they're paying the rent, like house is in good shape. Like, why did you even want to meet with me? And she's like, well, I'll tell you. So my son is kind of a deadbeat and he knows I get the rent on the first of every month. And on the first of every month or the second, he gives me a call and says he needs money. Okay. And I don't have the heart to tell him no. So I pay him and then I get behind. I give him money, which he says he'll pay me back, but he never does. And I get behind on all my bills, even though I'm getting enough to cover the the mortgage and everything. I mean, she was actually, you know, making a couple hundred bucks a month in cash flow even at the low rent. And she's like, all I want to do, Mike, is I want to sell this property. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to put it in a retirement account. And I'm going to put it in a retirement account. So when he comes to ask me for money, I can say, I'm not allowed to touch it it's in a retirement account. <laughs> just say, wow. I said, that's it. She's like, that's it. If you can just get me out of this thing, I don't want to deal with it for another month. On the first of the month, he's going to come back and ask me for the money again. And I know I'm going to give it to him and I don't want to give it to him. Wow. And we did the deal. And it was, I still own that rental property today. And it was a great rental property. And she was happy to, to be done with it. And yeah, I bought it at a pretty significant discount. Um, That's amazing. Wow. She didn't want to wait and deal with that, her son for a few more months. <laughs> no, Man, that, it was, that a... was it. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's, these are like those situations that you never hear about because it's probably too specific, but I think it illustrates the power of being just a human, a human, right? Like, I mean, this person was probably, it was in, obviously an intelligent person that wasn't mm -hmm. in any kind of, it wasn't in financial distress, more like a bit of emotional distress. And it's tough to suss out, but you're like, hey, well, like, I'm a real person too. I understand your pain point. I can deliver the solution that you want. You know, this is a deal that I can do. And for her, it made sense, right? Even though she was, you know, she might have got more and she marketed a deal, but then, the son would probably wouldn't have came back and be like, oh, wow, mom, I saw that you made, you sold this for 800K. Like, you know, I now have this new problem that requires this. And for her, net, net, she probably nets more doing directly with you than she would have, you know, yeah. gone through the brain damage of a few more months and brokers and showings and all that, all that, all that nonsense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. kudos to you. And I think that's where. And, and it's kind of funny that you don't like you say you're not good to hospitality, but this is like, I mean, that's kind of like hospitality, right? Like you're servicing, sure. a, I mean, you're servicing a need that, you know, maybe not continuously. <laughs> it's like a one shot thing versus uh, on the Airbnb side. But, uh, but, you know, look, I mean, congrats on that. I mean, how, so how many rentals do you own? How many rentals do you own now? Uh, we just have three. Three? Not many. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. how big is your staff, your sales staff? Um, so right now, um, I had two sales reps, but I let one go recently. So I have one, but I am looking to hire, um, a couple more by the end of the year. All right. If you're, if you're, if you're a sales rep looking to work for someone, great. You should contact, uh, Mike's information will be in the show notes. You should come to co contact Mike and, uh, and talk to him. Yeah. yeah he's, uh, yeah. He, he, I will, I will vouch for the fact that this man is a great teacher and learn, and learn a lot like I did and make a lot of money like I did. <laughs> 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 well, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's I like it, it, it. It's true. It's true. Um, let's talk about let me let's transition over a little bit to you know you obviously have built a nice business for yourself in in Jacksonville. Before the before we got on, we were talking about the market, right? You know, obviously it was a very hot real estate market until twenty twenty two three. You know, kind of pick your pick your point, and then as rates has, have increased. And obviously in Florida with the weather issues, you know, we're recording this October 2024, which has had 
two major hurricanes go through. You know, maybe describe how that's impacted your business with the kind of the general slowdown in, in, in real estate. And I think Florida, like there's a lot of noise about how things are, you know, been really, um, things are, are, are painful right now there for real estate investors. Yeah. You know, I think that there's a couple of things that shifted. So at the height of the market, when interest rates are low, Jacksonville was a hot spot for institutional hedge funds buying properties. And I used to sell a lot of properties to institutional buyers. So once interest rates changed, that kind of went overnight, right? The institutional buyers were like, well, it no longer makes sense for us to buy these properties at six and a half, seven, eight percent rates. Actually, hey, hey, Mike, can I pause you for a moment just for folks? Uh, can you define institutional investors, please? Yeah. So it's typically like hedge funds. So um, they would probably own anywhere from 500 to 3,000 single family homes okay. uh, in just the Jacksonville market, which is pretty significant, right? Considering that there's only about 250,000 homes in the uh, market. 10%, yeah. 10 plus percent. Um, so there was multiple, multiple of those institutional buyers and Jacksonville wasn't the only city that they were buying in, but basically these institutional hedge funds saw that, I mean, Blackstone was, you know, the original ones who started this after the crisis, but they realized that, you know, they could get money at X and put it into single family rentals and make a return on it. Right. And obviously the values were going up. So they were buying a lot of inventory of what we called locally hedge fund houses, which are 1990 and newer builds, three twos, you know, 1200 to 1800 square feet. So during that time, a lot of people who were flippers were really just flipping to hedge funds as opposed to flipping to the retail buyer. Gotcha. And now that market's shifted, right? Yeah. Now, um, I haven't sold a house to an institutional buyer in <laughs> two years. <laughs> so <laughs> Who's there was a year now? where I, there's a year where it was probably, you know, I don't know. I, they, they maybe were 70% of the deals that I would do. Um, uh, we're going to institutional buyers. Um, Who's buying it now? Um, retail, I'm just selling it to homeowners, right? We're okay. renovating right. the properties and selling them, or you know, we would do some wholesale, so we do sell to a couple other investors in town, or um, you know, we'll put stuff as is on the MLS. So, kind of, you're just just normal, the normal way of doing real estate is <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Until fair twenty enough. until 2018, <laughs> the way of doing real estate before. So. Fair enough. Fair enough. Look, I think it's a positive. You know, but, you know, I'm sure the hedge funds are renting them out too, but, you know, getting that housing stock back to actual, the person on the deed is actually the person living there, I'm sure has some, some nice positive knock-on benefits as well. But it did, um, obviously rates impact the market in general, but in Jacksonville, on top of that, when you've got institutional buyers purchasing, you know, 25% of the inventory at a time, right? When those buyers drop off, that causes things to change. So... I mean, fast forward to now, like a lot of the people who were doing what I was doing back then, a lot of them either they were too heavy into institutional buyers only, they didn't pivot enough. So they kind of, some of them lost their shirts there, holding onto a lot of inventory. Yeah. Um, others just, you know, a lot of like, when there's hard economic changes, partnerships dissolve, right? People realize that, you know, if we're going to make a change, well, we're, you know, it's kind of hard. It's when you're making a couple million bucks a year, you're like, well, you know, even if everything's not perfect in my partnership, then, well, we're going to keep doing it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of like, kind of the partnerships fell apart here. And then a lot of the people who were just wholesaling and they were just doing a deal here or there because wholesaling was the hot thing. When he started to have to know sales and negotiation and really how to put a deal together and to bring capital to the table, they were no longer buyers in the market. So it's become a lot easier to buy. Obviously, you run into issues now where there's some like issues of people bought their house recently, there's not enough equity. Right. So that's something you run into. But um, it's, you know, it's more challenging to sell, even like a fully renovated, you know, retail product on the market. So, you know, it's always this thing. It's it's always a, when you're flipping it's either easier to buy and harder to sell or easier to sell and harder to buy, right? Because they're inverse of each other. Right. So right now we're just focusing on making sure that we can pick up, negotiate really well, pick up things at prices that actually make sense so we can get the deal done. And then we've recently started doing some unique stuff with our renovations because we realized a lot of people are doing just cookie cutter renovations. 
And, you know, we still have like a standard template we follow, but we just added some upgrades that kind of make our stuff stand out. Nothing okay. crazy, just, you know, nice different color tiles in the bathroom, barn doors, things that you just don't usually see in a two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand yeah. dollar home. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's helped keep kind of our days on market still like, you know, within a few weeks we're under contract. Whereas oh, wow. there's okay. a lot of stuff sitting on the market right now. That's great. That's great. Well, I I won't dig in further there. There's some nice trade secrets that you've built out. So um great to hear that I think there's a lot of misinformation out there it's just too broad i think you kind of have you find someone that's really deep in the market that's doing deals and there's always a way you know if you're creative enough and you know you have something that you do very very well for you selling like you can make it work i mean you and you have to just pivot and try new things i'm sure you know you probably had some deals that didn't work out perfectly and you're like oh well actually why, why these barn doors the ones in barn doors seem to have 10 fewer days on market. Like, let's, you know, it's probably not yeah. a standard temp, you know, not a standard template that you buy. Like, oh, maybe we should do barn doors. Are, are they hard to do? No, you just, you know, okay, like extra, you know, X dollars, but, you know, it's 10 days fewer holding period. That sounds like a pretty good, you know, and we're getting the price of you. Well, let's just do this. And then I think, you know, I think one thing that gets lost is like, once you pick up a few, you know, for me, it was just that one postcards. <laughs> or barn doors, like you, you pick up one or two things that you learn that you learn that works two or three of those things. And then you kind of, you have a business because you know yeah. how to do that or, you know, knowing how to talk to a home seller, like a, like a real person that has a family issue or, you know, whatever, whatever inefficiency that you found in the market, you're able to deliver that solution at scale. Like then, you know, you create a nice business for yourself. So, uh, you know, kudos to you for that. Yeah. Um, I want to, you know, and we're, we're, we're kind of hitting, hitting up on time, but it just, cause I could talk to you for hours uh, and I have, and I have, uh, talked to you for hours, uh, with my <laughs> problems, but, um, I, I want to just talk a little about, you know, cause I think a lot of people here are short-term rental real estate investors and they hear a story about, oh, well, you know, Mike was doing short-term rentals for, you know, since 2014. So six years and then doing flipping. I mean, you were pretty successful at it. You you had a big meetup in New York and brought a lot of people together. Obviously, New York market has changed a lot since 2014. But to the extent you want to talk about, like, yeah, you reference Phoenix being, or, you know, Arizona being a disaster. And instead of like kind of going to what the disaster was, but like, what did you kind of learn from that? And how does that kind of made you a better investor? Yeah. The biggest Easy lesson question. I learned from, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest lesson I learned from Phoenix was be different. And what I mean by that is, and I'll tell you everyone what happened because it's just what happened, um, is when we went out to Phoenix and uh, we started looking at different markets because Jersey City, there were some rumb rumblings of regulation that was going to be passed. We were doing really well there, but we decided, well, if there's rumors of regulation that aren't going to be favorable, we probably shouldn't be investing more money than we already have. So we did what everyone did. We went out and we looked at the data, right? AirDNA at the time. I don't know if that's still what people use, but that's what we were using at the time. And um, we were also looking at regulation in the Phoenix market, actually the Arizona market in general. And this is all at the time, guys, because I have no idea what's going on now. Had really favorable regulations where the state had said that like cities actually couldn't really restrict short-term rentals beyond a certain amount. So we thought that that was favorable. And then kind of the data showed that, you know, there was a good, we were doing a lot of arbitrage. So there was a good spread to be made between what we could rent something for and what we could make on a short-term rental. We made a bunch of deals kind of like you guys did in, in Philadelphia with uh, owners of large multifamily buildings. And um, we started ramping up there. And uh, <laughs> what we discovered is that other people had also been looking at that data. <laughs> And uh, also ramping up a lot. And um, we, essentially the market cannibalized itself because we had nice units. Don't get me wrong. These are two bedrooms, three bedrooms in multifamily buildings with all the amenities you could want, like pretty nice place to stay, right? But so many units were coming on the market to the tune of like a couple hundred every month that the prices, we thought we were going to get 150 a night and we were getting like 50 or 60. And there was not 50 or there was not a room for error in our projections of, a hundred dollars a night. Right. Right. Um, so 
what I learned from that is you got to be different. The problem is it was so easy for everyone to scale up in these large multifamily buildings and the lack of regulation that everyone decided to do it, including us, which meant that like, okay, great. Your units are decorated nice. Well, so is everyone else. Right. Because right? they're all corporate, you know, corporate companies who know what they're doing. And so if I want to do it again and be different, I probably would have looked at like the type of inventory that's kind of hard to replicate. I yeah. would have said, and I just got back from, from Scottsdale. Right. And you know what I did when I went to Scottsdale, I said, I don't want to stay in an apartment. I want a single family home with a pool and yeah, I had a mini golf thing in the back. I didn't actually play it, but I was like, that's kind of cool. Right. Like that <laughs> option of playing it. <laughs> the, right. Like maybe it just made me click in the listing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I would have done something different. All right. And that's kind of a lesson that I took from there that I've applied in my investing, right? In, in the flipping business, which is when the market started to change and there's a lot of competition because there's a lot of flips on the market, I'm like, well, let's do something different than everyone else. Yeah. Um, That's a great point. But yeah, I learned that lesson the hard way in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I want to take a slightly different angle on that one. Um, you know, I think there is... I mean, it would surprise you that Phoenix is, at least downtown core Phoenix is actually a very, very good, mar- now it's an actually a very good market and a lot of, some, some supplies come up, come out. Although if you look at the numbers, we still use their DNA. So I think the gold standard, um, supplies continue to increase. I think the demand is just kind of, there's probably just too much supply at that one period of time. And then okay. the demand didn't have time to catch up. And, you know, if you're not well capitalized, you know, you have to, you, you have enough runway to, have the market right sides itself, but it's, you know, we have uh, a student in our mentorship program who has over a hundred units in overall, and he has 70, 80 units in downtown Phoenix. And I've seen some of the numbers and they're, they're, they're I mean, so those three bedrooms like are fairly, are pretty eye-watering actually what you can do to help some like really, really eye-watering returns there that if you had told me, I wouldn't have believed it until I saw the numbers. It was like, oh, wow. Okay. It's like, it's pretty legit here. So, and he does do some things that are different. You know, we, we kind of teach more on design, you know, I think you, you got to design it a little differently, you know, from a location perspective, you want some barriers to entry. And I think from your point about being unique and the house that you stayed in Scottsdale, I definitely think like now buying, like we just bought a place in the Catskills. I think I told you, I may, mm-hmm. I may or may not tell you this. We, we just closed in June. Um, but we really looked for something that was, you know, unique, had a unique views, unique location, backyard that we could, you know, put in a hot tub, a sauna, a uh, really nice fire pit. Um, we ran out of time, but, you know, we're going to build this nice deck that you can see the ski runs and geodome and a pool, a cowboy pool, not a real pool, but, you know, good enough for kids. Just like, and then some outdoor games that, you know, the, the mini golf. Just things that like really will stand out. And I think that is like, if you are, I would say if you're buying right now, like that definitely is the game. Like the the $500,000 house that worked, you know, the $500,000 $500, house that you put 20K in that worked really well in 2022, 2021, doesn't work now. Mm-hmm. Now it's, it doesn't mean necessarily more expensive, but it just has to have like much more unique features. You have to do a lot more with it. You can still win, but the game has definitely evolved. Um, the playbook for 2020, 2021, that just doesn't work anymore. I think on the arbitrage side, what I would say is in a similar vein, obviously you can't do like a lot of backyard stuff, um, but it's more of finding markets that have some sort of regulations. I think that's actually a good thing. Um, in Philadelphia, for example, there's some pretty strict regulations. And if you are in the right, if you have the right zoning, the right buildings, those kind of, those kind of things, those are, those are real barriers to entry. So if you're listening, you know, Mike's point is absolutely spot on, right? Like you don't want to have a commo- like you don't want to have a commoditized product in general, right? Just because all you're doing is competing on price and that's really a lose lose situation, right? You you want to find some differentiation, whether in the property, regulations, amenities, whatever it is that you can set yourself apart because that'll give you pricing power and that will attract hopefully higher quality gas and you still have to serve them. Uh, which I guess with Mike, it's uh it's good you don't like that, you know, one less uh, high quality operator to compete against, but because um, <laughs> <laughs> you have all you have all the tricks in your bag. But uh, it, it, 
it's it, it's it's the game is different. Um, it still can be very profitable. But now we're doing, you know, eight hundred thousand dollar night stays, right? We're not doing the three hundred dollar night mm. stays that like we're the bread and butter. So you just have to kind of evolve your game, I, I guess. But yeah, the Phoenix is uh it's not it's not bad actually. Yeah, yeah I'm not saying that no one going to Phoenix. This is more just my experience at the time, which was what, I don't know, six or seven years ago. But I like what you said about the cat skills place that you have. Because um, the last time I looked for, besides before Phoenix, I wasn't going to get a sauna in Phoenix because I don't, you don't need a sauna in Phoenix. <laughs> but <laughs> just the Airbnb outside. I stayed at, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The Airbnb I stayed at before that, though, you know what I was looking for at Airbnb? Sauna, hot tub, pool. Like those were my things. And I was willing to pay a lot of a premium just to have a sauna because I like going in a sauna. I like that sauna. And yeah, I did. <laughs> and there was only a certain amount of like listings that had it and, and I just picked the best one and there was only maybe I wasn't you weren't that person wasn't competing against uh 500 yeah. anymore they were competing against 12 20 yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> Exa- exactly and then if you if you can layer on the amenities where you have a v, you have obviously high quality a product that's well designed like we spent we use Summerled um it's a design firm we actually paid it's like you know um a six figure amount to just to design work just to design work um, wow and then obviously the the cost to do the work and then the amenities so it's you know it's a it's significant investment but you start layer, layering on a house that was built in you know less than 15 years ago view of the mountains nice backyard hot tub sauna that's you know really that's like really well done landscaping fire pit with like real outdoor lighting and then next year mm-hmm. we build the deck with a geodesic dome that looks out the the cowboy pool the outdoor chess the putt putt course uh the volleyball court you know like those kind of things right like you know i don't want to compete against you know I, the, the goal is like try not to compete against anyone right like you just have a really great product and someone you know our goal is like someone or two groups of families in New York City that want to take their families, you know, within two hours of New York, get in a car and drive up for four or five days and enjoy themselves, like, and willing to pay a premium. Because it's, it's not, you know, if you think about it, it's not that much, right? It's like 1200 a night, or 50, 50, let's say 1500 a night, which is the high end, like 750 a night, okay, when you split between two people, right? And then you have, you know, two kids, Okay, so let's say that's two hotel rooms, like three hundred bucks a hotel. Like you can't get a hotel room for three hundred dollars a night in New York City anymore. Like you're in mm-hmm. you're in the Hilton on Forty Second Street. That's a five hundred dollar night hotel, and that's a hundred square feet. And you're you know like so that's the that's the that's the thought process that we have that we have, and we've only operated for two months, and it's done well. But you know, I think you need twelve months to to have a better bearing if you're right or wrong. But um, I think that's where we really tr- you know on the short term rental side really try to to teach others like this is like a playbook that works um but it it's not you know it's not as easy right you have to do the work but you have a really nice quality property in the end um you know versus some of the you know ones i'll say in the poconos or whatever it's like two hundred thousand dollars it's like built in 1950 and like uh, it's you know uh, like i wouldn't go back i want to like i just more like i want to go to a place where i go back so Hopefully, I can host mm-hmm. you, and uh, if you ever want to go up up there, you can take a t- check it out and let me know what you think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm down. Um, <laughs> uh, the uh, we've gone way over time. I, I really enjoyed this conversation, and, and you know, appreciate you kind of sharing what you're doing in, in Jacksonville. Um, for folks out there that are you know interested in what you're doing and want to connect with you, what's the best way for folks to reach out to you? Um, yeah, um, you can just, uh, DM me on Instagram. So it's Mike underscore McKay, M-C-K-A-Y. Um, or you can, uh, send me a email at Mike at unloadmyhome.com. That's U-N-L-O-A-D, myhome.com. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, I'll make sure to put all the contact information in show notes. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you are looking to invest in, uh, Jacksonville or looking for a, a really good sales role. Uh, reach out to reach out to Mike. He, he, I'm especially sure he'll if you're looking, you. especially if you're looking for a really, <laughs> if you're good, especially if you're good at sales and you're looking for a role. If you want to move to Jacksonville and make 250 grand a year, reach out to me. 
it's a lot better than uh, there are a lot of uh out of work enterprise SaaS sales people are right now so um you know if one of you guys are listening uh this is not, not a bad landing spot i kind of got away from this question but for you i want to ask this because the question i want to ask you is what is the kindest thing that someone has done for you that's helped you in your real estate practice and i asked i've kind of gone away from this question but i've asked you this because like what the time you spent with me and liz to help us grow our business is actually one of the kindest things that someone's done for us so you know we appreciate that um so that's kind of for me that's one of the kindest things that's happened for us in our journey was uh your time and helping us like on the va side introducing us to you know the people within your network to help us grow introducing me to click to mail <laughs> um <laughs> You know, maybe, you know, is there something, you know, someone along your journey that has done for, for you, what you've done for me and Liz? Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, I think when I came down to, I mean, I'll give two examples because two of them really stand out to me, which is when I first came down to Jacksonville, I really, despite the fact that my, um, grandparents used to live down here, I didn't know anyone down here at the time. And I started reaching out to people and. You know, I'd reach out to them, connect with them on the phone before I got here. Still COVID, although that didn't stop much in Florida. But um, <laughs> a lot of people kept saying I should go to this one event, which was like, they're like, this is the best networking event in town. And they were doing it online. And um, I just said, okay, I'll go. And um, so I met one of the guys on uh, online um, who I didn't know at the time when I met him, but was one of the biggest, probably actually at, for quite a few years, was the biggest flipper in Jacksonville, buying about 400 homes a year. I didn't know that at the time. He just seemed like a cool guy on the, the networking event call. And he's like, hey, here's my number. Text me when you come to Jacksonville. And I texted him when I came to Jacksonville. And I said, hey, I'm in Jacksonville. He, he said, we should get coffee. And we did. And um, yeah, he helped me out on a, a ton of my deals. I mean, we probably did, as I was learning kind of the wholesale side of the business, I probably did 25, 30 deals that I joined and ventured with him to learn the business in the beginning. We split the profits on. Nice. Um, so that made a, and I learned a lot of stuff from him as well about like kind of leadership and business. So he's a great guy. I'll just throw his name out there. Cause he's cool. His name's Pat Flynn. He's also got a podcast, which is cool. Um, so he helped me a lot. So that's one, one of the kind of things. And the second is, uh, actually a guy I had on my podcast, Jonathan Wisman, who wrote the book sales boss. Um, the time he's filmed me on my podcast and after, and then he's helped me some time since I actually saw him when I was in Phoenix, but, uh, he kind of broke my belief on that. I, at first I was, I was doing all the sales myself and closing all the deals and he just broke my belief and then helped me build out the structure to build a successful sales team. Yeah. Broke my belief that I was the only one that could do it. He's like, you can hire people who are better than you and you should. And then taught me the path of how do I find those people and how do I hire them? How do I onboard them and how do I make them successful so I can build a great team of sales reps who make a lot of money for themselves and also make a lot of money for me and are you know happy to that's important yeah. uh so those two people i mean there's many more but those are the two that come to mind when you ask that question well, well, shout out to to pat and shout out to jonathan for uh yeah you know having an abundance abundance mindset and you know this has been been great to have you on and you know folks that are listening um you know really try to find good quality people on the, on the podcast to share their stories. And if you found this helpful, you know, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, uh, the YouTube channel, or to, you know, if you're using Spotify or Apple podcasts or what, uh, you know, whichever podcast platform, please definitely share, subscribe. Uh, we'll have, uh, other guests on that, you know, uh, we'll present different perspectives on real estate investing more broadly. Uh, in short term rentals and uh you know appreciate you listening. And Mike, uh thank you for thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and sharing all these uh nuggets of wisdom wisdom with uh SCR like the best community. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. If you found this episode valuable, please make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can get notified when I put out new content on every me investing. And if you want to learn about how to work with me more directly, I have links below on my description click on those and let's figure out how I can help you with your Airbnb investing journey.